While this is not a political channel, recent political events surrounding Donald Trump have ignited a wave of curiosity and sparked intriguing questions about possible parallels to the life of Jesus Christ. Let's be clear, we are not suggesting that Donald Trump is comparable to Jesus Christ. However, this exploration is meant to highlight interesting similarities and contrasts that have emerged in public discussions. These comments are also not a show of political allegiance. We believe this topic can provide a fresh perspective and foster thoughtful conversation. Your input is greatly appreciated and we encourage an open-minded and respectful dialogue. Our aim is to captivate your interest with a compelling narrative that connects past and present in a way you may not have considered before. Stay with us as we seek out this fascinating comparison that promises to be both thought-provoking and engaging. The conviction of Donald Trump on 34 felony counts related to falsifying business records has been a significant legal event. These charges stem from allegations that Trump engaged in deceptive practices to conceal various financial transactions. The legal process has been extensive, involving numerous court appearances, media scrutiny and public debate. Trump's opponents have portrayed these charges as evidence of his unfitness for office, aiming to discredit his leadership and diminish his influence. Throughout this process, Trump has faced intense public humiliation, with every development in the case being broadcast widely, fueling both criticism and support from different segments of the population, both nationally and internationally. As we look back into the final days of Jesus Christ leading up to his crucifixion, we see a striking narrative similar to the recent events surrounding Donald Trump. The last days of Jesus were marked by a series of events designed to undermine his credibility and humiliate him publicly. He was betrayed by one of his closest followers, Judas Iscariot, for 30 pieces of silver, as is recorded in Matthew 26, 14 to 16. This act of betrayal sets the stage for his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane where he was forsaken by his disciple and taken into custody by the temple guards in Matthew 26, 47 to 56. Jesus was then subjected to a series of trials before the Jewish Sanhedrin, Pontius Pilate and Herod Antipas. Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, initially took charge of Jesus' case. The Jewish leaders brought Jesus to Pilate, accusing him of claiming to be the king of the Jews, which they framed as a challenge to Roman authority. Pilate, however, found no basis for a charge against Jesus. After questioning Jesus, Pilate declared, I find no basis for a charge against him, as recorded in John 18, 38. Despite this, the Jewish leaders insisted on Jesus' execution. During this period, believe it or not, Pilate's wife sent him an urgent message warning him against harming Jesus. She had suffered greatly in a dream because of him. Matthew 27, 19 recounts this. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. This dream further unsettled Pilate, adding to his hesitation. To avoid making a decision, Pilate sent Jesus to Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee. Since Jesus was a Galilean and Herod was in Jerusalem at the time, Herod was curious to see Jesus and hoped to witness a miracle. However, Jesus did not perform any miracles, nor respond to Herod's questioning. Frustrated, Luke 23, 6-11 recounts that Herod and his soldiers mocked Jesus, dressed him in an elegant robe, and sent him back to Pilate. Pilate, again faced with the decision, tried to release Jesus, stating that neither he nor Herod found him guilty of any crime deserving death. Luke 23, 13-15. However, the crowd, influenced by the chief priests and elders, demanded Jesus' crucifixion. Pilate offered to release Jesus as part of the Passover amnesty, but the crowd chose Barabbas, a known criminal, instead Matthew 27, 20 to 21. Jesus' trial before Roman and Jewish authorities revealed a profound narrative of injustice and moral dilemma, intricately linked to a cosmic battle against Satan. Behind these events, Satan was orchestrating a grand scheme to publicly humiliate and ultimately destroy Jesus. Both Pontius Pilate and Herod Antipas played critical roles in this saga, showcasing their reluctance to condemn an innocent man while Satan orchestrated a plan to publicly humiliate Jesus. This cosmic battle is highlighted in the Bible, beginning with Genesis and culminating in Revelation. So the conflict between Jesus and Satan began long before the crucifixion. In Genesis 3.15, after Adam and Eve's fall into sin, God declared to the serpent, Satan, 
and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This prophecy foretold the ongoing struggle between Satan and humanity, culminating in Jesus' ultimate victory over sin and death. The book of Revelation also provides a vivid depiction of this cosmic battle. Revelation 12, 1-5 describes a vision of a woman about to give birth and a dragon, Satan, poised to devour her child. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter, and her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. This imagery symbolizes Satan's efforts to thwart God's plan of salvation through Jesus. In the midst of his suffering, Jesus' identity as the savior of humanity became even more apparent. He bore the sins of the world and offered himself as the ultimate sacrifice to reconcile humanity with God. This act of self-sacrifice underscored his role as the savior, willing to endure the greatest suffering for the salvation of humanity. The crucifixion of Jesus was not just an end, but the fulfillment of his mission to save mankind. Isaiah 53 verses 5 to 6 prophetically speaks of his sacrifice. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray, each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus conquered sin and death, offering eternal life to all who believe in him. Jesus himself declared his purpose in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. His resurrection was the ultimate victory, proving his divine authority and the truth of his teachings. With taking on an enormous responsibility such as the saving of others, while going against the grain of what appears to be popular opinion, there is no telling what the outcome will be. In the case of Donald Trump, his public legal battles have taken an unexpected turn. Contrary to what his prosecutors might have anticipated, the legal actions against Trump have surprisingly galvanized his support base rather than diminishing it. Many of his supporters perceive the charges and the legal process as politically motivated attempts to publicly humiliate him. This perception has fostered a sense of solidarity among his base, who feel that Trump's treatment reflects broader injustices they believe are directed at them as well. This sentiment has been amplified by Trump's rhetoric, which frames the legal battles as a fight against a corrupt system. Trump's statements such as, they want to get to you, but I'm standing in their way, resonate deeply with his followers. They interpret these words as a personal defense against an overreaching government. This narrative has reinforced Trump's image as a political outsider willing to challenge the establishment, making him a symbol for those who feel disenfranchised by mainstream politics. As Trump has continued to fight the charges, he has capitalized on this narrative, often referring to himself as the last line of defense against a rigged system and promising to make America great again. His defiant stance against the charges alongside his promises to root out corruption and protect the rights of ordinary Americans has only increased his followers' loyalty. In stark contrast, the public humiliation of Jesus Christ, orchestrated by Satan, has not elicited the same widespread loyalty and support. Jesus' trial and crucifixion, despite being the ultimate act of sacrifice and love, often fail to evoke the steadfast allegiance from humanity that his mission deserves. While Trump's supporters fiercely defend him against perceived injustices, humanity's response to Jesus' ultimate sacrifice is often lukewarm. Despite the awareness of Jesus' suffering and the cosmic battle against Satan, many do not exhibit the same fervent loyalty and commitment to Jesus as seen in political allegiances. Jesus' mission was to save humanity from sin, a task he accomplished through immense suffering and sacrifice. John 3.16 encapsulates this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Yet, despite this profound act of love, the dedication to Jesus' cause is frequently overshadowed by earthly pursuits and leaders. The Bible addresses the issue of leaders leading their congregation astray. Jeremiah 23, 1-2 says, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. 
Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people, ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. The book of Matthew speaks to the blind, leading the blind. Second Peter 2, one warns, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. These and other verses warn about false shepherds, prophets and leaders who lead God's people astray through their actions, teachings, and neglect. The passages emphasize the responsibility of leaders to care for their flock properly and the consequences of failing to do so. With this said, we need to take responsibility for our own relationship with God. We have to be steadfast. In Matthew 10, 32, 33, we see that whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. These passages highlight the importance of genuine faith and obedience to God's will, as well as the consequences of denying Jesus. We have seen the extent to which Satan went and will go to prevent humanity's reunion with our Creator and Savior. Perhaps the worst part of Satan's deception is his subtlety in adjusting one word to turn the truth into a lie. Sometimes we may deny Jesus without even realizing it in that moment. But once we are aware, we will be held accountable for this, as it will no longer be a decision made out of ignorance. We see where traditional far-left voters on the Donald Trump political scene have had a change of heart their decision did not emerge out of their liking for him, but as they have expressed, it's due to the logic of what's best to save the nation. Tradition does not always serve our needs best. Will Jesus' supporters see themselves in his plight, interpreting his challenges as a reflection of their own struggles against a system they perceive as corrupt and unjust? As Satan gave the illusion of taking Jesus down, in reality, he's after us. Christ is just in the way. By rallying around Trump, his supporters believe they are standing up not just for him, but for themselves and the future of the nation. This has turned his conviction into a powerful tool for mobilizing and energizing his political movement rather than the intended consequence of discrediting his leadership. The story of salvation continues in Revelation where it is prophesied that ultimate recognition of Jesus' lordship will come, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, Philippians 2, 10 to 11. This future acknowledgement contrasts sharply with the current varied human response to Jesus' sacrifice. The public humiliation and trials of both Donald Trump and Jesus Christ highlight a profound narrative about loyalty and human nature. While Trump's supporters rally behind him with unwavering dedication, Jesus, the savior of the world, often receives a less consistent response. Despite knowing the cosmic battle against Satan and the ultimate sacrifice Jesus made, many do not seem to exhibit the same fervent commitment. This contrast underscores the need for a deeper recognition of Jesus' sacrifice and the salvation he offers, urging humanity to embrace him with even greater passion and loyalty. There have been observations and a host of talk and questions regarding what seems to be the blatant disrespect of Christianity, specifically the mockery of Christ, even in this modern age. The question is asked, why is it that of all the global religions, Christianity is the one being mocked and to such an extensive degree? To what extent do you believe Christians show acceptance and allegiance to the savior of humanity, Jesus Christ?